So by the end of the earlier Rook period, by about 3800 BCE, we see artifacts and features of a Rook material tradition begin to show up outside of the southern Alluvium. So on the map here, you can see the kind of the Rook heartland here that we've talked about. Um, and the first area where we see that kind of expansion is into southwestern Iran, into the Susiana and De Loran Plains um, in the area here. So this becomes relatively quickly incorporated into the Rook world sphere. But eventually it makes its way up the Euphrates and Tigris river systems and we start to see a different type of interaction. Unlike the Ubaid period where um, local populations kind of adapted Ubaid material styles, um, Uruk materials don't replace those of the northern Mesopotamian tradition, but rather appear in conjunction with them. We do see sites that are founded for the first time during the Uruk period um, and these uh, sites are founded on virgin soil and they generally are built with uh, Mesopotamian style architecture and contain southern Mesopotamian style goods. However, at some other sites, Uruk materials appear in the same context as those indigenous late Chalcolithic local materials, um, which tells us that we have uh, groups of people who are living together, um, occupying the same space, but using different material traditions and are likely different culturally through this. And then there are a host of sites that are local um, in their characteristics and appear to be part of a, an indigenous cultural development. Um, so we can kind of see this as um, the differences represent two or more separate groups of people who are living on the landscape and occupying much of northern Mesopotamia at this time. So the Uruk system, while it spreads, it doesn't spread in the way that we would think about an expansion milit expansive military state where it conquers these kinds of populations, although we'll talk about some examples at the site of Hamakar where this might actually be uh, the case, um, right? But rather it expands through trade um, and controlling access to resources. And it's because of that Guillermo Agaze adopted Emmanuel, Emmanuel Wallerstein's explanations uh, for the capitalist world system um, to talk about an Uruk world system in which southern Mesopotamia and the regional centers in southwestern Iran um, showed cultural supremacy, hegemony, or even military power, or expressed military power over the northern uh, peripheral regions of northern Mesopotamia. Um, so according to Agaze, he basically sees this as a system where uh, Uruk Mesopotamia exploited these peripheral regions so that elites could, quote, sanction existing social inequalities, extend the amounts and varieties of commodities and labor at their disposal, and increase their political power, end quote. So Agaze is basically looking at this as saying the elites in southern Mesopotamia are building their prestige based on access to resources that they don't control. Think copper and stone, gold and silver, these prestige goods. And in order to maintain their system, they then have to turn what they do have, which is plenty of food and labor, into materials that can be traded. So for Agassi, it's primarily textiles. Um, and then, the, so raw materials, lumber, copper, timber, uh, gold, silver, stone, like diorite, are all coming into the Mesopotamian alluvium from elsewhere. Um, and they're being exchanged for goods and services that uh, something like textiles or even labor itself uh, through this process. So in order to maintain the system, Algaze proposed two types of Uruk settlements in the periphery. <coughs> Excuse me. He proposed enclaves, which were essentially colonies. These are settlements that are closer to the core with sizable populations built in a Uruk Mesopotamian style. So they have southern style architecture. They're using southern Mesopotamian uh, style pottery and goods and social organizational strategies. So these are constructed at uh, locations of major waterways and trade routes. And they ensure the control, like the first dibs of goods and resources that are flowing through these regions for the Uruk state. And we'll talk about two examples at the site of Jebel Aruda and Habuba Kabira. But Agassi also proposed outposts, these kind of small, isolated settlements that are far, much further out in the periphery. Um, and these were built in critical junctures of trade routes, and they're established within existing indigenous communities. 
So here we can kind of think about smaller groups of people, maybe 25 or 50 traders, who go in and live with an existing community to extract local resources and send them back to southern Mesopotamia. Examples here include Godin Tepe or Hajanebi Tepe. There, these are also contrasted with these larger indigenous sites, those that contain no uh, Uruk influences, but are substantial settlements in their own right. And if we look at the the trajectory of development of some of these sites, like sites like Arslan Tepe, are likely the head of a relatively large regional polity that would have competed with the Uruk system for goods and resources in the surrounding area. So. For Algaza here, we see the system where southern Mesopotamia is clearly dominant, um, either in terms of cultural uh, uh, superiority through hegemony, uh, but also possibly through military superiority. And it's extracting resources from a less advanced subservient core. Now, some people have challenged this kind of assumption. Gil Stein proposed more of a peer polity interaction suggesting that you had smaller scales polities in northern Mesopotamia that uh, more or less a, agreed to trade with southern Mesopotamia on a more symmetrical basis. Um, and there's still a lot of debate about this archaeologically. The site of Jebel Aruda is likely one of these enclaves that um, Algaze was talking about. It's a relatively uh, small Uruk settlement constructed on a limestone ridge overlooking the Euphrates floodplain. And this would have been, uh, according to Agaze, a regional center. Um, and his evidence uh, for that is that it has uh, a very similar layout in its central ceremonial court to that of the Inanna precinct. You have a couple of storage facilities, large great halls, tripartite systems. Um, that we might represent as temples or houses of the elites um, here within this uh, that are highly decorated in southern Mesopotamian style. That is, they have these cone mosaics. Um, they have the niched and buttressed elaborate uh, facade. Um, and so we can kind of think about these as being the local temple structures, re recreating that administrative compound at Uruk Warka um, in the Ayana precinct here at Jebel Aruda. And then it's surrounded by relatively large tripartite architecture. Um, which would kind of point to the existence of better off individuals within this compound. This might be the administrators or regional governors of one of these types of systems. Now contrasted to Jebel Aruda is the nearby site of Habuba Kabira. Um, much like Jebel Aruda, it's also founded on virgin soil. It also has its own administrative center with a temple complex. But these are not as large or nearly as well elaborated as that at Jebel Aruda. And our residential quarters are much uh, more common or smaller. Um, it's uh, numerous tripartite domestic structures, but the artifact assemblages are identical to those of uh, middle to lower class households within a rook. So the artifact or assemblage here more or less looks like it's transplanted onto uh, the landscape here at Habuba Kabira South. The, now, Gregory Johnson has argued that Jebel Aruda, Habuba Kabira, and the associated site of Sheikh Hassan represent um, an exodus of population from the southern Mesopotamian alluvium. As the demographic pressures grew and Uruk Mesopotamia became harsher and more powerful, it oppressed its citizens. And Johnson basically argued as the system collapsed um, through revolt or rebellion or demographic pressure that groups fl uh, fled southern Mesopotamia and they brought their Mesopotamian style, Uruk style of life with them at these new settlements. Um, this is an interesting idea when we start to think about this, but the timing uh, in terms of, of the uh, radiocarbon dates doesn't necessarily support the uh, time up well with the collapse of the Uruk system at the end of the later Uruk period. But we do see the Habuba Kabira South is also uh, built with an extensive uh, fortification complex. Uh, you can kind of follow through the plan here. There's multiple streets and alleyways uh, that run through the city. It's built on a, a plan. It's surrounded by an 840 meter long wall that's uh, almost four meters thick. And it's reinforced every 14 meters or so by these bastions, these towers that extend out into the wall that you can defend the wall from and contain two guarded gateways um, into the compound. So whoever built Habubu Kabira um, and sites like Jebel Aruda were concerned about its safety, either uh, from protecting the control of resources from exterior communities that they were oppressing in the uh, indigenous periphery, or concerned about retribution uh, from the Uruk state itself 
Um, either way, this defensive uh, fortification is incredibly important. 